everyone. Um, sorry, we're slightly late. We had a few tech issues, but we are here now. Welcome to the 14th Skills Workshop Virtual Careers Fair. Super excited to be here with you guys, and um, I hope you're really looking forward to the session today. So for those of you who've been here before and followed the programme since June, welcome back. And to anyone joining for the first time, welcome. I'm your host, um, Tanasha Tandy, and alongside 60 different firms, we've created the Skills Workshop to give you the skills, knowledge and insight you need to prepare for a career within asset management and also help increase application success. So as a reminder, all of our sessions are free to register and the details are in the chat box. So please do sign up to as many as possible. it will be great for you to kind of get an idea of different firms and the different ways in which different firms are approaching recruitment. So this virtual careers fair is like no other. So I guess following on from the pandemic and the virtual world that we've been living in, we have been able to create something truly special. So over the months of September and October, we're featuring 41 different firms every single day for one hour. Each of these firms will be telling you what they do, how they hire, and what skills you need to demonstrate to stand out in front of the crowd. And it goes without saying that it's a super competitive world out there. So these types of sessions should really set you up well for success. So last night you heard from Amundi. Today, it's the turn of my very own firm, BlackRock. So joining us today, we have myself, Stephanie Zaharieva, who works in our campus recruitment team, and Temi Femi who works in our consultant relations team, and also joined us in the graduate scheme back in 2018. So she can share some really great insights around what the process was like and what it's like to join the firm as a graduate. So between us, we will introduce our firm, we will talk about the different areas of our business and we'll talk a bit about what we do. And also we'll be here to answer any questions that you have. So please keep asking questions as the session goes on. So Stephanie will kind of start with touching on our program, programs and how you can apply. And then also talk about the deadlines and other useful bits of information that you will need to differentiate yourselves. So do listen carefully and take lots of notes. So if I can ask the team to kind of introduce themselves, Firstly, Steph, I will start with you and then move to Temi. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Lovely to see so many of you that have joined us and thank you so much for your time this evening. My name is Stephanie and I'm part of the EMEA campus recruitment team and I've been with BlackRock for just over a year. Thanks, Steph. Um, I was going to move over to Temi, but I think she's having a few tech issues. So I will just quickly provide an introduction to myself. As I mentioned, my name is Tinashe Tandy. I am part of the institutional sales team within our BlackRock ETF business. And I joined BlackRock three years ago, having joined from Schroeder's where I started um, on the grad scheme there, spending four years in sales and one year in equity research. So with that, I will pass over to Stephanie who will take us through the BlackRock programs and process. Over to you, Steph. Thank you so much, Nashe. Welcome everyone once again. Um, I want to give you a quick overview of our various early in career programs, our recruiting process, and how you can make a successful application to BlackRock. I know you guys have probably listened to many of presentations like this, so I'm gonna keep it very interactive. If you do have any questions, please make sure you pop them through the chat box and I'm happy to answer them at the end. So first I'm gonna start by covering all of the business areas that we have here on offer for the graduate and summer analyst program. We cover 11 business areas and they are advisory services, analytics and risk, business management and strategy, business operations, finance and internal audit, human resources, investments, legal and compliance, marketing and communications, sales and relationship management and technology. All of those roles, of, all of those teams have detailed explanations and job specs on our website and I'll provide you with the link after the session. You can go and read in further detail to see which one's most suitable for you. If I move on to the next slide, I want to highlight our four core early career programs you can be considered for depending on your eligibility. Our full-time analyst program is our flagship graduate program here at the firm, and it's open to students who are studying towards their undergraduate or master's degree and have or graduated between January 2020 and December 2022. Candidates must have less than 18 months of directly full-time relevant work experience. The full-time analyst program, which typically starts in early August, is a multi-year training journey designed to empower and support analysts in connecting their personal passion and strengths to BlackRock's mission, principle, and purposes. The program begins with orientation to learn about our purpose, business, and strategic priorities, 
all whilst gaining insights into the day-to-day -day life here as an analyst at BlackRock. Following orientation, analysts join the business areas and stay connected with their colleagues across the globe through ongoing training and professional development. This program offers analysts the chance to have a lasting impact on the firm and contribute to something great, a collective purpose to help more and more people fun experience financial well-being. Opportunities for this program are available across most of the European locations. Our summer analyst program is an eight week paid internship over the summer, and it typically starts at the end of June and is designed to provide you with an exciting, supporting and fun experience, which mirrors the life as an analyst here at BlackRock. You'll have real world responsibilities during the summer, in addition to participating in professional development, networking and social events. The summer analyst program acts as a feeder to the full time analyst program for the following year. To be eligible for this program, you must be graduating in 2023 and have less than 18 months of direct relevant full-time work experience. The third program I wanted to highlight is our placement and our off-cycle internship programs. These programs are for students who are required to undertake a mandatory longer internship as part of their course and are graduating in 2023 for a six-month internship or 2024 for a 12-month internship. If you're studying in the UK and you're required to undertake an industrial placement as part of your degree, you can apply for opportunities on our placement programme. These opportunities are available across our technology and sales and relationship management businesses. If you're studying in Germany or France and required to undertake a six months internship as part of your course, you can apply for the off-cycle internship programme in our sales and relationship management businesses in Germany or alternative businesses in Paris. And lastly, sorry, one second. And lastly, if you're in your, if you're currently in your first year of a three-year degree and a second year of a four-year degree, graduate, <clears throat> graduating in 2024, you're eligible to apply for a Spring Insight program, offer, offered in our Edinburgh, London, Milan, and Zurich offices. The Spring Insight program provides you with a week-long, in-depth look at our businesses. You experience life at BlackRock through classroom sessions, work shadowing, networking, and social events. The Spring Insight Program acts as a feeder to our Summer Analyst Placement of Cycle Internship Programs. In addition to our core programs, we do have two other programs we offer to our students. Firstly, our Women of the Markets. This is an interactive program designed for women who are passionate about building and analyzing investment strategies, portfolios and products. The program will take place between the 18th and 19th and the 22nd of October. Undergraduate or master students with less than 18 months of full-time work experience who are graduating between Jan 2022 and December 2023 are able to apply. And secondly, our Black Heritage Insight Programme. This programme helps students, students learn more about BlackRock, who we are and what we stand for. It features Black professionals at various stages of their career, providing an insight look in what it means to be part of the world's largest asset manager. The program will take place between the 20, 20th and the 22nd of October. Once again, to be eligible for the program, you must be an undergraduate or master's student with less than 18 months of full-time work experience and you're graduating between Jan 22 and December 2023. If we move on to the next slide. This is an overview of our general assessment process. When applying to BlackRock, candidates are able to submit only one program application to the program you are eligible for. However, as part of the application, you can choose up to two different business areas you can be considered for. So for instance, you can choose to be considered for technology support as well as Aladdin client services. The application process will be the same for all of our programs and we'll start with a short online application form, which will ask you for your personal details as well as your CV. After you have submitted your CV, you'll then receive a link from Highview to complete a short video recording in which your virtual cover letter. In this video, you answer two questions related to your motivations for the role and the firm. So how does it all work? You'll be able to click on the link either in the email from Highview or in your application portal, which will take you to the video platform. You'll then be given the opportunity to test the system and do a practice question. However, once you start the virtual cover letter, you must complete it in one sitting. The question pops up on the screen and you have three minutes to prepare your answer. Once the preparation time is up, you'll be re recording your response for up to 90 seconds. You can cut both the preparation and the recording time short if you wish. There is no penalty to give a shorter answer than 90 seconds. It is very important to note. If you apply to two business areas, you're required to complete two cover letters, one for each. 
If you apply for a role outside of the UK, you're required to answer one of the questions in the local language. Cover letters must be completed within 72 hours of submitting your CV. This also includes the weekends. So please make sure once you apply, you only apply once you're ready to complete the cover letters. These cover letters are then reviewed by the teams you apply to, who will shortlist the candidates they wish to interview. At first round interview, you'll participate in two times 30 minute interviews conducted via live video with the member of the team of which you've applied to. These interviews will focus on BlackRock's principles, but you should also be prepared to answer technical and motivational questions. If you are successful at first round, you will then be invited to final stage interviews, all conducted virtually. The structure of the assessment stages varies depending on the division. However, these will typically consist of further interviews, perhaps a presentation or a case study. There is an exception to the process I've just explained. It is if you apply to a software engineering position. If you apply to a software engineering role, you'll be required to complete a short coding challenge instead of the cover letter. The coding challenge is primarily in Java. However, you have the choice of answering the third question either in Java, JavaScript, or Python. At the end of the coding challenge, there is a short video question. The coding challenge must be completed within 96 hours of submitting your application. So to summarize, Please submit your application online to one program and you can select up to two teams. Complete the relevant cover letters and coding challenges within the deadline. And if you do not meet the deadlines, your application is considered incomplete and will not be progressed. All of our programs and teams are now open for applications and the deadlines are up on the screen. This is very, very important. If you are interested in Women of the Market or a Black Heritage Insight program, the deadline is this Friday. So please make sure you get your application in. All of our other roles are analysts, summer analysts, placement and off-cycle program. The investment business areas are closing on the 22nd of October and all other business areas on the 12th of November. And if you are interested in our spring insight program, all business areas are closing on the 3rd of December. I'm going to keep this slide up for a couple of moments in case anybody wanted to take a screenshot or take a picture just to remember. But all of this information is also available on our website. If I move on to the next slide, I'm going to open it for questions very shortly. If you do want to apply, please make sure you visit careers.blackrock.com forward slash early dash careers. Make sure you stay connected with us. We post a lot of article and articles and information on LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And of course, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to email us at Mia Campus Recruitment at blackrock.com. I'm going to pause here for now and take any questions if there are any. Thank you, Steph. Um, so we're going to open up for um, some questions now. So thank you so much for all the questions that you've been posting um, in the Q&A. Please keep them coming in the Q&A. I know some of you have posted some questions in the chat, but if you could put them in the Q&A, that would be great. Um, so I am going to kick things off with a question for Temi. So Temi, um, please, could you introduce yourself and then also tell us a little bit about your journey to BlackRock, why you chose BlackRock and I guess your experience so far. Yeah, thanks, Nasha, and hi, everyone. Sorry again for joining a little bit late. I had some technical issues. Um, but yes, my name is Temi. I joined BlackRock 2018 on the graduate program, and I also interned the year before in 2017 on the um, in our global consultant relations team. So it's one of our sales teams at BlackRock. Um, so I guess why I chose BlackRock, honestly, I think it was the people. Um, I, like many of you guys, kind of applied to lots of places um, during my um, second year of uni when I was like looking for different internships and um, I, I would honestly say like I think just from the interview process itself and like speaking to people at BlackRock and coming in for like you know these kind of events and and like the um, sort of um, yeah the sort of networking events and everything like everyone I spoke to was just super, super nice um, and it seemed like a place where you know every firm has like their principles and their website and everything but it did actually seem quite genuine at BlackRock so that, um, that definitely stood out to me versus um, other firms that I was interviewing with. Um, and then when I joined as well on the internship, um, of course, like an internship, you, you know, you're trying to impress like the people, but also you're using it as a way, you know, to confirm that that's the place you want to be at. So I definitely, you know, met with lots of people, spoke to so many different people. And I just, again, I really enjoyed my experience. I felt like, you know, the principles were sort of um, resonating with everyone there as many people as I spoke to 
um, especially like, you know, the one black rock element and the collaborative element, which is something I really wanted for, I guess my first kind of, it was gonna be my first job out of uni and my first corporate experience. So I definitely wanted somewhere that would um, have that sort of collaborative um, like principle and like, you know, that would be living it in, you know, in practice. And um, someone that would give me lots of exposure. I've worked, I'm in a sales team, so it's a, it's a more generalist role. So I kind of knew my skill set. I didn't really know exactly what I wanted to do. So I wanted a role and a firm that would kind of, um, you know, allow you to learn as much as possible and be exposed to different parts of the business. Um, so that's kind of why I chose BlackRock. I hope that's answered the question. <laughs> Thank you, Temi. That was great. And I guess following on from that, another question that we've got that's come through is what do we think that makes BlackRock stand out from its competitors? Um, and I guess I can kick this one off. I would say from my perspective, I think it's the people. I think the um, quality of the people, I think the attitude of a lot of the people that we work with, I think is amazing. I think everybody is, everyone is kind of working towards a common goal. People work really hard. There aren't any slackers. Everyone kind of wants to get the job done and wants to get it done to an exceptional level. And I actually think the people are just so nice. And I think before I joined BlackRock, honestly, I think I came from a firm that was very much like a family and I was very comfortable there. And I joined BlackRock and I thought, okay, BlackRock, biggest asset manager in the world. This is gonna be terrifying and the people are gonna be super scary. But they were actually, everyone has been so nice and I was really pleasantly surprised. So I would say for me, it is 100% um, the people that makes it stand out. Um, Steph, what, what do you think? What are your thoughts? I'm going to answer this from a recruitment standpoint. Um, when you guys are looking for opportunities and you will be applying to many firms, let's have it right. You're not just going to put all your eggs in one basket. Um, but what I would say, you guys are so lucky that you have Google at your hands. Literally, you can Google anything and have the answers ready for you. And when I was actually interviewing for BlackRock, I went on to Glassdoor just because I wanted to see what kind of feedback people leave about BlackRock and what really stood out for me. And that will touch on, on Tinashe's point as well about the people is even if people that were leaving reviews were not successful at their roles, they had nothing negative to say about BlackRock. Um, they were very thankful for the feedback they received, et cetera. And for me, that really stood out because most firms, when you apply, you just genuinely get like a generic rejection email and that, that stays there and you never hear back from them again. Whereas BlackRock goes out of their way to make sure you do have detailed feedback. And if you do reach out, you would always get a response. To me, that says a lot about the people that work there. And like Tanasha said, everybody actually cares about the job they're doing and they want to perform to a high level. I think a lot of that also comes from our senior management. It's filtered down to everybody and the directions are very clear. We also have our core values um, and everybody kind of lives by them as well. So that is very important at the firm. Um, so we've had um, a few questions about um, what happens if somebody has more than 18 months experience, work experience, and then also, I guess, as a byproduct of that, um, are there any programs available for MBA students? Yep, I'll start with the MBA programs. They're currently only available in the US. Um, so if you are interested in MBA, then you can have a look at the America's um, work experience. But we have an MBA program just in the US at the moment. We haven't rolled it out in Europe. Um, in terms of the work experience, is it direct relevant work experience to the role you're applying to? Or is it like a retail job? Because that wouldn't be classed um, as direct relevant full-time experience. So if you have, let's say you're applying for um, investments and you've spent, I don't know, two years working in the investments team, um, a bank, uh, then yeah, that would be classed as relevant full-time work experience. But if you spent two years working at Zara, that wouldn't be. Um, so yeah, it really depends. Yeah. Um, and a question, another question is, how much of a disadvantage are we at if we apply for a full-time analyst program if we haven't done a spring insight or summer internship? So maybe Steph, you can answer that from, I guess, the recruitment perspective and maybe Temi, your experience of kind of joining the grad scheme as an intern and when other grads have joined who weren't an intern, how they kind of found the experience. 
Definitely. I'll start from a recruitment standpoint. Um, you're not a disadvantage because we do want to see students from all different backgrounds. Um, I would definitely say if you don't have any work experience, please highlight um, any societies you're part of, any extracurriculum activities that you do outside of um, school, uh, college, university. Um, also, if you've done any kind of things like Jack Petrie Awards, all of that, make sure you put it on your CV because that just really shows what kind of person you are. And you need to remember that your CV is the first document and representation that we see of you. We don't actually get to meet you in person. So make sure you list all of the things you've done on there. Um, even if you do voluntary work, et cetera, that is very important. So just put it on there. Yeah, I would kind of just echo what Steph has said. Um, I don't think it would really put you at a disadvantage. I'm thinking of like some of my friends who didn't do the internship and we kind of all did the same kind of graduate training together. And obviously your, own, your, your individual respective teams will give you the training required because again, like my experience as a summer intern versus now as a full-time like associate is, is different. Like I've, you know, I even mean, I got to do some projects and stuff. I wasn't like stuck in the work. So I think the team still recognized I would need training. Um, and, like my individual team um, gave me the necessary like training that I would need to kind of get started on the role. And then HR will obviously do the, um, the overall grad training as well. So you get to meet other people because yeah, I think that would be the only maybe advantage I would say, like, you know, people before you come in as on the grad program, if you did the internship. But again, there's so many opportunities you said like network and the other grads and your team will also introduce you to lots of people across the firm so I wouldn't really say there's a major um, disadvantage um, from not doing a summer internship. Um, a question Steph around the cover letter so any kind of advice around the virtual cover letter how to how to I guess write that I mean when I think of cover letters it fills me with dread because I used to hate the cover letter but yeah any any tints and tips for the cover letter I would definitely say write some notes down and maybe practice with a friend to make it look a little bit more natural. Um, you guys are actually at an advantage given it's been COVID the last two years. So everything has been online. So you should be used to kind of recording yourselves or being on Zoom or WebEx. Um, one thing I will say is when you are ready to record your cover letter, make sure you are in the room on your own with absolute silence. You know, you don't want your mum coming in saying your dinner's ready or something like that, because that can throw you off. <laughs> Um, and straight away you know you might be disabled from the um, cover letter so make sure you are somewhere where no, nobody is disturbing you definitely keep some notes with you and you can even stick them on the wall in front of you um, and then you can just read off them if you need to I know they're super awkward um, but just try to practice and prepare your answers um, like I said you know, there is no right or, or wrong answer for the virtual cover letters. It is literally your opinion. Obviously, I can't give you the questions, um, but yeah, just prepare, research the firm, what we do. Um, I would also say read about current news that we've featured in recently, um, and that will give you the edge above other people. Don't just read Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> When, um, when I saw the question that said virtual cover letter, in my mind, I thought it meant like a Word document that you're just submitting online. And I was like, well, didn't we do that anyway? I didn't realise it was an actual video now. It's a video. Yeah. So you have to record yourself. Um, you get you get like a test run um, and then you have to record yourself and you have like 90 seconds per question to answer. OK. Um, I would say also, I remember because I... Yeah, you've I, done it. So you can give yeah. them some <laughs> I definitely did a few practice runs. Um, one thing that surprised me was like how quick 90 seconds go by. So I practiced a few questions, but um, definitely, I think when you're speaking in person, you just, you know, you don't have a time limit. You use so many like filler words and all of that stuff. So before you know it, like 90 seconds have passed and you haven't actually answered the question. So definitely practice and practice with a few kind of different, you know, sort of questions that you may kind of expect um, just to make sure you get all you want to say in 90 seconds. So yeah, definitely practice, practice, practice and try and be concise. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Um, I guess on that, following on from that, so we've got some questions around how do you prepare for technical questions, particularly if you are um, applying for an investment area? Um, I guess I can kick that off and say that I think for me, I did not have any sort of financial background when I was applying for graduate schemes. And so that was probably one of the most daunting bit because it was essentially saying I need to just understand like, what the stock market was going from that kind of basic 
um, level. And I think the biggest bit that helped me was just simple things like the Financial Times, The Economist, just reading market news. And then where there were things that maybe I didn't understand, Googling what those things meant, trying to get a definition of those things. And then the more articles that I would then read, it would then start to make a little bit more sense. And let's be honest, like when I was answering some of the questions, there were, I'm not, I'm not saying I fully understood what I was saying myself, but at least I could say something that was probably convincing enough. And I would say that, yeah, reading articles <laughs> in FT was definitely a main way of doing that. And I think also try and speak to people who are doing those roles already, because they can give you a really good um, idea around the kind of areas that you should focus on and just give you kind of hints and tips around what things mean and the kind of things that might come up in an interview. So yeah, just use your resources around you, use your internet and speak to people and join events like this would be my advice, but what do you guys think? Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I would also say that, like, be honest, like, don't mention something that you haven't researched or you don't know anything about, because yeah. if you start talking about, I don't know, like, China, um, China clamping down and, like, you know, their sectors and then, like, you get um, asked further on and you're like, actually, I have no idea what I just said, then that will look quite bad. So I think just kind of mention what you're comfortable speaking about. And, you know, if you're applying for, like, analyst and, and internships, people... Luckily, don't expect you to know that much. So, like, <laughs> as long as, you know, you have some sort of commercial awareness, especially if you're applying for, like, a market role, an investment role, um, you know, be able to speak about what you can. But, yeah, don't kind of go down a uh, mention something you have no idea about because if they kind of, you know, ask you further, you don't want to kind of embarrass yourself. <laughs> so, yeah, I would just say kind of, yeah, <laughs> research, but, you yeah, know, don't mention anything you're not comfortable with. I echo absolutely everything you guys are saying um but you touched on a very important point there Temi make sure you're not lying don't lie on your CV and don't try to kind of fake it until you make it in an interview because you can easily be caught out um yeah. if you don't know the answer to something just be honest um you are a human uh you're not interviewing for a director's role you're interviewing for an internship or a graduate position and the interviewers are you know, fully aware that your knowledge won't be as, you know, strong as theirs. Um, so yeah, as long as you've done some research, and like I said, try to research about news that we've recently featured in. So that's, that will give you a conversation uh, with one of the interviewers, um, you know, that will show them that you haven't just read Wikipedia and what we do and how many employees we have. So just try to think outside the box. Um mm -hmm. I would also say try to get a mentor in the industry as well. Um, you know, I know sometimes people might not respond on LinkedIn or whatever, but at least you've tried. Um, and most of the times people are there to help. So if you are really interested in a certain position, I don't know, maybe just reach out to people and ask them to, you know, help you or become a mentor. And most of the time people will say yes. And I think just to um, add on to that as well, I think ultimately people are looking for potential. So they are, yeah. like as they said, they're not looking for the ready-made products. They want potential and they also want somebody that they can work with because you underestimate the fact that you spend all day, every day with these people. You spend more time with people you work with than you do with your friends and your loved ones. So I think people want people who they can spend time with, who've got potential and those are the main things, not necessarily whether you know like what a DCF analysis is, which I 100% didn't. And I did get asked that in an interview once and I said, like, what is that? And then it was yeah. fine because we just moved on. So yeah, <laughs> just be honest and be yourself. Um, I think next question, which kind of leads in that. So a bit about you guys kind of background. So what did you kind of study at university and kind of what made you want to go into finance? Um, I can go. Um, I actually didn't go to university. Well, I did. And I left after my first year. Um, it just wasn't for me. Um, I did an apprenticeship and I kind of worked my way up. Um, but I've worked in finance in the last 10 years. Um, I started as a recruitment coordinator. And yeah, I just kind of feel like I fell in the right place at the right time. Um, but yeah, I, I just, you know, I would always say to people, if you are not enjoying something definitely don't do it for the sake of doing it because you will spend a lot of time at work so you need to make sure you actually like your job um, so if your passion is you know not banking or investment management or whatever it is please take time and evaluate exactly what you want to do because there's nothing worse than spending nine thousand pounds a year 
and it just goes down the drain. So really, really think about, you know, what's your next steps and try to be strategic with your plan, you know, your five-year plan, your 10-year plan, et cetera, and where you see yourself going. Um, but yeah, I'll definitely say, you know, for certain roles, you do need to go to university. So, you know, if you, you want to be really technical and work in some of our technical teams, then you will need a degree. Um, you will need to be able to code. Um, I'm quite lucky that for my job, I didn't need it um but I would say I have been to interviews at certain firms where they have questioned me on why I don't have a degree and maybe I just never got the role because of my education um so I'll definitely say you know education is key do get your degrees but if it's something that you're not passionate about then definitely look at alternatives and how you can train yourself up um yeah so I did philosophy and economics at uni um I didn't actually know I wanted to go into finance I kind of just did it because I was indecisive I did both at A levels and I was like I might as well do both at uni because <laughs> I didn't know what to pick um but so I think a lot of people who picked economics at uni as a degree kind of did it with the intention of going into finance so I made all these new friends like Freshers Week and literally after Freshers Week, everyone was talking about Spring Weeks and I'd never heard about it before. <laughs> so I started getting along to like all the talks and like not, I went to the University of Nottingham and we have like a really big economics and finance society. Um, so um, quite a few firms kind of come to uh, like our uni to give talks and, um, you know, we just have lots of events around that. So I just started going along and just started knowing more about, I guess, the different roles you can have in finance. Mm-hmm. But I, honestly, to be fair, I wasn't still that convinced. Um, and so my first year, I actually did an internship at the civil service just because I didn't know what I wanted to do. So I kind of was open to various things. So I applied to different like sectors and industries. Um, so I did like a two-week internship at the civil service. I liked it, but I kind of wanted to do something else um, in my second year like of you know work experience. So I applied to more kind of private sectors and corporate like um, sectors and stuff. Um, again, didn't know specifically I wanted to do... Um, you know, going to the asset management industry or anything. So I did a few different roles within finance, um, ended up um, accepting a role at BlackRock and um, realised that I did quite enjoy it. Um, and it kind of was um, quite suited to my skill set and, you know, would give me kind of the skills and what I wanted out of like a, my first job out of uni. But um, so, yeah, I kind of ended up, ended up in the industry by accident. Um, but, um, yeah, I would say, you don't know, like in my role, because it is more of a generalist role, um, I would say I think everyone does have a degree, but most people, um, you don't technically have to do an economics degree. There's people in my, in my team who kind of did history or did music or did languages and, and things like that. So um, I would say, you know, just kind of study what you want at uni and what you enjoy. And most roles, apart from, you know, if you don't require you to you know, have a specific degree, especially as the, the industries evolving and trying to get more diverse candidates into, you know, certain industries. So I have friends who are like, you know, portfolio managers in equity who like did history. So it's definitely um, <laughs> um, the, yeah, the industry is definitely getting a bit more open-minded with things like that. So I think it's, yeah, it's okay. Yeah, I would definitely echo that. I would say um, if you do want to go to uni, do what you enjoy because, and especially yeah. now with it being 9,000 a year, like really do what you enjoy because, <laughs> I, I did not study anything finance I actually studied economics for six weeks and then decided I didn't like it and then changed to law and I am no I'm not a lawyer I work in finance so I was completely <laughs> confused um but the moral of that story is my degree actually just doesn't I mean I did not need my degree to work to do what I'm doing now and I think to Tammy's point we work in kind of similar business areas like people have very broad different degrees and it's just it's more about the kind of skills that you have. And I guess in being in like a sales role, like being good with people, being um, interested in people, yeah. and being, I'm a little bit nosy. So I think a sales will work for me because I like asking questions. So um, I would say, yeah, do, do what you enjoy. Um, enjoy your time at uni as well, because it's, you know, if you're going to go, it's three years, hopefully the best years of your life, just enjoy the time. Um, but yeah, just don't think, I mean, I guess certain roles you probably do maybe need to do specific, maybe subjects, but I would say broadly speaking, um, yeah, do what you enjoy. And I would say I kind of came into it just because I think similar to Temi, when I was at uni, a lot of my friends were kind of applying for jobs and going to like campus recruitment sessions. And I just kind of went along because I thought, okay, this seems interesting. And I feel yeah. like I could be doing it. 
And then all of a sudden everyone's talking about internships. And I was like, oh no, if I don't get an internship, like what am I going to do this summer? So that's kind of why I started applying and um, yeah, and kind of just fell into it, I think as a lot of my friends did. So yeah, that's kind of my, my journey. Um, question for you, Steph, around Women of the Market event. So what specifically does it entail and could it provide a fast track for full-time application? Absolutely, that's correct. Um, so during the three days, you will hear from different teams within investments. And then on the final day, you will have an interview session with certain teams from the investments platform. Um, and yes, if you are successful, that will take you straight through to the assessment day for the summer analyst program, which will take place in November. And it's the same for the Black Heritage Programme. I saw one of the questions in there. Um, but yeah, the Black Heritage Programme is a pipeline for the Summer Analyst Programme. So you will be fast-tracked if successful within the two days. Um, and just a question, I guess, on the kind of uni topics, we've got a question that says, does it matter which uni you attend? Does it have to be a Russell Group or Oxbridge? No, so actually we don't attend any universities um, and this is purely because we don't want to have a targeted university group. So we want students to apply from all different universities. Um, and if you go onto our page, you will see that we only host in-house events. Um, so we do, all, well, when before COVID, they were in person. However, now it's everything's virtual. Um, but we host a series of events throughout the autumn and they are all BlackRock events. Um, so you can have a look on our page and sign up if you are interested to any of them. Um, and they all uh, specify in different areas and cover different topics uh, within BlackRock. But no, it doesn't matter which university you go to. Um, you don't have to go to a Russell Group or a Oxbridge. So yeah, please apply. Um, and another um, question around coding. So um, somebody has asked, you mentioned that the code view test was mainly in Java. If we don't have any background in Java, does this exclude us from the selection process? Yes, as the coding test is done in Java. Um, so maybe try to practice before you apply, I would say. Um, but, you know, one of them one of the questions you can select python um so maybe try try to do it if it allows you um but definitely you need to have some java element into it um a lot of the coding platforms in blackrock are actually java as well and don't um, ask me to teach you because i can't code <laughs> me neither <laughs> um Another question around um, distinguishing a successful application from a non-successful application. So what are the kind of key things that make an application stand out and what is basically going to get you put to the side? What I've started to see recently is that a lot of students have CVs that are like four and five pages long. Guys, please, there is no need to have such a long CV. You're just starting your career. So I'll definitely say, please try to keep it to one page to maximum if you've done loads of work experience or voluntary activities, et cetera, and you want to list them on there. Definitely no need for the five page CV. Um, also, a lot of people start to attach their certificates and you know degrees and, and whatever transcripts to the CV as well. Again, we don't need to see any of that at this stage. So please don't scan them in either. Uh, it, it just messes up the whole platform. And, you know, once we start viewing CVs, it just doesn't look great. I will also say attention to detail. You'll be surprised how many people make mistakes on a spelling, or, um, spelling mistakes on a CV. You guys have a word. There is no reason why there should be a spelling mistake on your CV <laughs> or your name should be in lower capital letters. Um, just, you know, get if you're not sure, get somebody to read it over. It's always nice to have the four eye check. Make sure everything's spelled correctly. Try to keep the same font consistent throughout the CV. Don't have bright colors like red, green, purple, because it does hurt the eyes once you start reading it. Um, don't have any kind of imagery or your pictures on there. Um, nobody needs to see that. Um, also, don't disclose your age, etc. cetera. Um, yeah, just try to keep it plain, you know, just black and white, one font consistent throughout. Make sure you format it properly. Keep it the same uh, size, etc. And just make sure there's no spelling mistakes. And don't lie on your CV. So, you know, don't say you can speak seven languages fluent and you can't. Um, so that's really important as well, because that will be tested at one point as part of the interview process. Thanks, 
I was just going to add from like an interview um, kind of perspective, because I've done like a few, you know, I helped out with a few of like the intern interviews and like the grad interviews. I would just say it sounds like you hear it all the time, but like, don't say the obvious stuff that you can read on the website. Like, I want to work for Black because it's the biggest asset manager. Like, it's actually surprising how often <laughs> you still hear it. Um, so I would say just be a little bit more thoughtful in your answers and show like you've done a bit more research and like, you know, even if it's stuff like the principles or, you know, Larry's letter or like stuff you've heard about Blackrock in the news, like just draw from different, like maybe not so obvious experience, um, you know, answers. And even if like you are going to say it's the biggest, like, you know, mention why that's impressive and, you know, talk about like, you know, further reason than just because it's the biggest asset manager. And um, I think it's probably just part of like your prep, but if you're you know because a lot of the questions might be like motivational situational like try and draw from different experiences again like you're a student so you, you know you're not going to have that many probably what most of you won't have lots of like corporate experience but you know think about what you've done like your part-time jobs or like your volunteering or as part of societies and try and draw from different experiences because yeah there's some, nothing worse than like you know people asking you questions and you're just drawing from the same two examples so try and think about all your experiences and like the skills that you can get from each one whether that's time management or resilience or customer service or etc and think about which examples like you know throughout your life you could use and sometimes it could even be personal but um yeah I think just yeah part of your prep um that be that usually stands out because yeah you'll be surprised how many people have like two examples that they're drawing from for all the answers <laughs> Thanks, Jeremy. and I think just to add to that something that I was really impressed by um this year actually in the interview process was coming across a few people who had not only spoken to people at the firm but had reached out to people and they didn't even know those people and kind of yeah. reached out to them on LinkedIn had a chat with them beforehand and then come to the interviews fully versed in Blackrock as a firm and not as Hemi said just the obvious things that you can read and I thought that was super impressive because I think it took guts to reach out to somebody you don't know and also to really try and understand the company and then also to speak about that so yeah, yeah definitely kind of not not the obvious um another question question for you temi so what is the work-life balance like for analysts and what are the typical hours that you work particularly in sales hmm so i would say it probably differs from analyst to analyst depending on your business division um with sales and like in my team it's not that bad i think um obviously certain periods especially at quarter end or if I have like like for example this week I've got quite a few client meetings so there's quite a lot of prep that I need to do so I might be working a little bit later than usual um but I would say I can probably like you know maybe like 8 39 to 5 36 sometimes a bit later but I think what's what's more important is that there isn't really much of a FaceTime culture you know whilst we're, you know whilst virtual said there's not much face actual FaceTime but even pre-pandemic you know if if I'm done all my work and I literally have no reason to hang about, I don't actually have to like, you know, just chill about and, you know, um, stay in the office, like, you know, past five or 5.30 if I'm not, if I don't have anything to do. So I think it's like, it's more of a question of like, make sure you get your work done. Um, and yeah, naturally there'll be, you know, times when it's a little bit busier. So you work a bit longer, or you start a bit earlier just to make sure you get your work done on time and you prioritize, you know, your clients and your, like, you know, your work deliverables. But I would say it's, it's yeah, it's not that bad. Thankfully, it's not much of a face and culture. And we also have like our flexible time off where, you know, you can take time off and um, you can work from home, even though we're all working from home now. But um, so that kind of helps with that like, um, work, work life balance as well. So yeah, I would say it's not that bad, but it varies. <laughs> yeah, I would, um, I would echo that as also being in a sales role, I think, yeah, similar kind of hours but I think the ultimate thing is like we are treated like adults and it is like yeah. we are adults here just get the work done so if the, if getting the work done means you're kind of done by five o'clock great go and live your life but if getting the work done means that you might need to be working till like eight o'clock on occasion or nine o'clock on occasion that's just how it is but it's not an expectation where you're just gonna have to just sit there just to be seen to be sitting there absolutely not and that's one of the things that I love about our firm and I actually think also post the virtual world we've, we've been in and kind of going back into the office, I actually think there's going to be even more flexibility. So we're talking a little bit more around kind of flexibility around time that people go into the office or time that people leave because factoring in commutes and things like that. So I think, yeah, we're adults, kind of manage your own time, but it generally speaking, the I, I mean, I think the hours are great, particularly when I speak to people at other firms and friends at other firms where it can be very different. So yeah, I think it's, I think they're good. Um, 
question for you, Steph. Um, when do applicants begin to get shortlisted for first round interviews? So we screen all applications after the deadlines. Um, so you'll be able to hear back after the 22nd of October for investment investments businesses and 12th of November for uh, all other areas. Uh, typically give us about two to three weeks just because different teams recruit at different stages. Um, but definitely all interviews will happen before Christmas. So and that's my busy period. So yeah, I would occasionally work till eight or nine o'clock <laughs> trying to get you guys over the line. <laughs> well, we were all like winding down for Christmas and the Christmas fun. <laughs> um, another question for you, Steph. Going, just going back to, I guess, the kind of coding conversation we had. Oh, Tim, I think you're breaking up. Temi, she's breaking up for you as well. Yeah, she's kind of lagging. Am I back? You're back. Yeah, yeah, Am you're I... back. Yes, okay. you're back. Perfect. Um, are there any opportunities for those without a technology background to enter into any technology roles? Um, there is. So we do have tech roles that don't require coding, um, but you do have to go on a website and have a look at all the job descriptions and read through them, but check out our tech and ops uh, okay. department. Thank you. Um, and I've got a question around global. Are, are these programs global programs? Can you apply if you're based anywhere in the world? Yep. So we have the Americas and APAC as well. So you'll be able to see on the website um, the applications that are open for Americas and APAC. I would say uh, EMEA and APAC recruit at the same time. Um, however, Americas recruit slightly earlier. So if you are interested in going to the US, please start to look right now. Thank you. Um, and a question, an interesting one here. So I guess if there was one thing that um, we would change about the firm, what would it be? Oh. I don't have to say nothing. <laughs> It's the, honestly, I'm not just saying that, but out of all of the financial services firms I've worked in is the best firm I've worked at. And actually, when I wake up in the morning, I'm happy to go to work. I don't just think, oh, it's another day. Um, the culture is so nice and everybody is extremely helpful, no matter what seniority level they are. Um, they're always welcome, you know, for conversations, coffees, etc. So it just makes it really special. Um, but yeah, I don't think I'll change anything. Yeah, I'm trying to think and I don't, I don't know if I have an answer either. I feel like if there was anything I would change, it wouldn't really be Blackhawk specific. It's not anything that you wouldn't, you know, find at like a bigger firm, like in terms of navigation or, you know, certain pockets and like all of that stuff. But I, yeah, I think there's nothing like black or specific that like, you know, black, I would change this at black or but because I would, other firms don't do this or other firms don't have this issue, etc. cetera. So, um, yeah. I would agree with that. I think I actually was having a conversation with um, a friend the other day and we were talking about if there was one thing we could change about our roles or the firm. And it was actually interesting to think about it when we, when we really sat down, it was like, there actually really isn't. Even though we might kind of like joke and laugh about things sometimes, but I was like, it's actually like, I actually really enjoy it and I actually really enjoy my role my team so yeah I would agree I mean the only thing I might just change is um maybe a slightly bigger canteen because I love to eat so <laughs> I'm like sometimes I'm like yeah maybe the canteen could be a little bit bigger but that is so minor so yeah no I agree with you guys um question around feedback on applications how do we get feedback on applications that we've submitted so you'll have to wait again until the deadline. Um, and then obviously you'll start receiving feedback if you've been shortlisted or not. Um, if you haven't been shortlisted, um, you will receive a generic response, but you can email us and we will give you further feedback on that application. Perfect. But make sure you're applying for anything that you're only eligible for. So, you know, don't just apply for a random role that you're not applicable to apply for because then it's just a waste of application for you. So, you know, make sure you read and don't actually just waste your own time. Thank you. Um, and a question around um, the military. So does BackRock offer military transition programs for veterans and service leaders? Yeah, we do. But you will have to specify that on your application. 
but th there is a box where you can add it all in. <laughs> Perfect. Um, oh, this is an interesting one. So do you think we should list all volunteering or Saturday jobs and awards we've done on our CV or summarise slightly? I mean, how many Saturday jobs have you had? But I wouldn't go all the way back to when you were 14 and you were doing, you know, the, the paper round on a Saturday. I mean, I wouldn't go that far down, but I would say anything kind of A-level up, um, I would put on there because that would be quite relevant. Um, in terms of awards as well, I wouldn't go back down to, I don't know, year eight or year nine where you received a merit for something. Uh, try to keep it in like the last five years. You. Um, and one for you, Temi. For sales, do you get assigned to a certain asset class or is it rotational? Hmm. So I guess it depends on what kind of sales team you are in. Um, I think if I don't know if it's changed, I don't think it has. But when I was applying um, for the internship, I just applied for sales and relationship management. So I didn't know what specific sales team I was actually going to be in. Um, it wasn't until my first day I got a badge that said like Temi and like GCR and I was like what's GCR <laughs> so <laughs> I think you do <laughs> even though that was the people who were interviewing me but like all the questions were sort of tailored around um, just like generic sales and relationship management um, questions and not specifically like what do consultants do um, so because of my specific team um, we, we're generalists across different asset classes but I know there are sales teams for example I don't know if you're based in like I in an iShares iShares sales team you I'll probably more focus on like ETFs and, and things like that. But um, yeah, so I don't think you get a choice as, as to which specific sales team you're going to be, be you're going to be in. Um, so it would depend on what you're placed in. So it can either be more generalist like mine or a bit more specialist um, like an iShare sales team or, or, you know, another asset class sales team. And it's not rotational for mine either. But I, I think iShares might be rotational, but I don't know if that's still correct. But yeah, so it depends. Okay, great. So to um, wrap up, the final question that I'm going to ask is, and this is a question that's always asked before we close, so of all the sessions, um, one word or maybe a couple of word answers. Can you tell us what you wanted to be when you were growing up? And maybe a why as well, because we have a few minutes, so. <laughs> I wanted to be a dancer, like musical theatre dancer. <laughs> uh, did yeah. you dance a lot growing up? Yeah, I had a few scholarships, um, so yeah. but my mom told me that, you know, once you have children, your dancing career stops. So think about something that's more <laughs> proactive. <laughs> um, so yeah, my dancing career ended at like 22. <laughs> but yeah, I always wanted to dance with Beyonce. That was like my dream career. Uh, that would have been phenomenal. <laughs> I love Beyonce. I like, I literally know some of her dancers. Like, I follow them and stuff. I'm a bit obsessed with her. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't know. Um, what about you, Temi? What would you um, I'm trying to think. I think I wanted to be a singer at one point when I was really young, but then I realised I actually cannot sing. Um, and then I think at one point during second school, I thought I wanted to be like a surgeon. And then I didn't like sciences that much. And I thought I wanted to do law. And then I decided not to. And then I went to uni and I was like, oh, okay, I'll go into finance. Or again, I still wasn't sure, but yeah, I didn't really, really know, to be fair, but um, I'm kind of happy with what I'm doing now, so. <laughs> um, I think for me, I wanted to um, be an actress, but I quickly realised that I couldn't deal with the rejection because you go for like auditions and then they'd say no. And I thought to myself, this is absolutely not it. I was like, I cannot deal with the stress of this. So I was like, finance it is then. No job school for me into finance so um yeah that is what I wanted to do so cool thank you everyone and um, we are coming to the end of the session now really hope you enjoy getting to know um, about BlackRock and found it useful um, as Seth mentioned many of our applications are currently open so please do apply and hopefully you kind of take some screenshots so you've got the deadlines there but do refer to our website as well for further details and I think we're going to put some details in the chat box as well now so you've got various different avenues for those um, many people have also been asking about the recordings so yes, all sessions are recorded and they will be added to um, the Skills Workshop website um, shortly after this session. So please do go back and have a look. 
And don't also forget that you can still register for upcoming sessions. So there are around 27 more to go. So please keep, um, keep registering and um, keep joining and kind of learning as much as you can about different firms. And speaking of different firms, um, tomorrow we have the team from Reddington are coming up. Now, if you don't know about Reddington, Reddington is a really cool investment consulting firm. And investment consultants are essentially kind of the gatekeepers to the assets and kind of match up asset owners with asset managers. So really good opportunity for you to learn more about what they do and how they kind of fit into the process. And um, they're a really cool bunch of people. So please do um, join that session and find out more. So all there's left to do now is say thank you to the speakers. So thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Temi. And thank you everybody for joining and enjoy your evenings. Thanks guys. Bye everyone. Bye.